All right. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Africa Confronting COVID-19. This webinar is co-hosted by Columbia Global Centers Nairobi, Columbia Global Centers Tunis, and ICAP at Columbia University in New York. My name is Murugi Dirango, and I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. All the Columbia Global Centers, we have nine uh, centers around the world connect their various regions to Columbia University to facilitate research and scholarship. Let me now invite my colleague, Youssef Sharif, uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Murugi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome again. This time we're um, on again and uh, we have so many participants. So uh, we're looking forward for this great webinar. I'm Youssef Sharif, the head of Columbia Global Center Tunis. We're working on North and West Africa and uh, with uh, the Global Center in Nairobi, we're also trying to work as much as possible with uh, on African issues. Um, and we're very happy with this partnership with um, uh, ICAP at Colombia and also with the Tunisian uh, Center for Public Health in Tunisia. Thank you. And now I pass the floor to Wafa al -Sadr. Uh, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Wafa al -Sadr. I'm the Global uh, Director for ICAP at Columbia University. And similarly, very honored to co-sponsor this uh, webinar with colleagues at the Global Centers in Nairobi and Tunis. Um, so um, I'm going to start with a few introductory uh, slides and then go on to our speakers. Next slide. Just a few housekeeping, uh, uh, just a few housekeeping issues. Most importantly, please uh, uh, please keep your video off to facilitate uh, better transmission and uh, chat is possible only to the host and attendees cannot unmute so please uh, enter your uh, your questions uh, into the chat box uh, to the host. Next slide. So today I'm going to give some, uh, first we, you heard the introductions for, from Rugi and from Yusuf, and I'll give a, a very brief presentation with a global update on COVID-19. Next slide, please. So uh, just to give you uh, a brief update on where we're at today, as of yesterday, April 22nd, there were uh, more than 2.5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally. And I uh, stress the word confirmed because we believe um, and we know that there are many more cases than the confirmed cases. Uh, confirmed cases are those where an individual has had a, an actual test that was um, an actual test that uh, confirmed uh, that they were positive. We probably believe that at least uh, twice, if not three times, or even more, five times as many cases exist globally. As you can see, there have been more than 171,000 reported deaths, but also uh, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of recoveries. And obviously, the numbers of recoveries lags behind, as many of the cases have been reported recently. Now, the impact of this uh, pandemic varies substantially by region. And as you can see, 50% of global cases uh, currently have been reported from European countries, where about a third of the global cases have been reported from the US. 3% of the global cases have been reported from China. And at present, less than 1% of cases have been, of confirmed cases have been reported from Africa. At the bottom of this uh, figure, uh, the map on your right, you can see that the top countries in terms of the largest numbers of reported cases now are uh, the US, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. Next slide. I think we're done. Next slide. So the evolution of this pandemic is important to note. And in this figure, you can see that uh, early on, by the, uh, about the end of December, beginning of January, we're at the beginning of reported confirmed cases here in this uh, light orange. And these were the cases that were reported largely from, um, uh, from China and the Western Pacific and China and South Korea and so on. And then over time, you can see that now the majority of cases are being reported from in this darker orange from European countries, and in this yellow color uh, from the Americas. 
but you can also see as well that in, in the blue here at the bottom, uh, the numbers of cases reported from Africa as well as um, also as well as from continuing the reporting of small numbers of cases from the Western Pacific. But by far now, the majority of cases are from, you can see uh, here, uh, from uh, Africa and from, uh, I'm sorry, from Europe and from the United States. Next slide. Now to give you a sense about what's happening in the US and New York City where, uh, where we are situated, both the Columbia University and the, and the Global Center headquarters, um, the current snapshot is there are uh, 788,000 more or more cases, confirmed cases reported in the U.S. And currently, um, uh, the U.S., as I said, is um, about a third of the global cases all have been reported from the U.S. And 17% of cases have been reported from New York City. New York City is now at the epicenter of the global epidemic with uh, more than 132,000 concurrent cases uh, which is about uh, about half of the more than half of the total numbers of cases in New York State. Uh, actually, the numbers of confirmed cases reported from New York City are more is currently more than the number of uh, cases from any other country apart from uh, the United States. Next slide, please. Now, what about the situation in Africa? And uh, in the slide, you can see here that there have been uh, more than 23,000 uh, confirmed cases uh, from African countries. Uh, however, uh, that still remains, that is about less than 1% uh, of worldwide cases with uh, 1,160 reported deaths. And important to note that the majority of the, of the cases have, been, uh, the majority of African countries have reported uh, cases of uh, COVID-19. And the reason for our webinar today is, of course, there's a great concern in terms of uh, the potential impact of transmission of this virus in African countries in all the regions of Africa. As you can see here, the majority of the cases have been reported from North, North Africa and then also uh, substantial numbers of cases, and uh, those have been from Egypt and Algeria and Morocco. Southern and Southern Africa and South Africa has reported the large, largest number of cases but also there's a uh, concern about the evolving uh, epidemic in West Africa with substantial numbers of cases being reported now from countries like Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Ghana, and other countries in West Africa. Next slide, please. So if you look at the global trends per continent, um, Look at North America, for example, you can see here and the y-axis is uh, 10,000 cases and the, and the y-axis here. And you can see that in North America, uh, the U.S. is certainly um, uh, leading in terms of the, the numbers of, uh, of new cases and numbers of cases reported. Uh, in Europe, there's been uh, the countries I mentioned already that have been most severely affected have been Italy, Spain, uh, France, and Germany. However, there's also concern now about increasing numbers of cases, for example, in Russia and Belgium, amongst other countries. In Africa, while again, if you look at the y-axis, numbers of cases has remained small, but nonetheless, there's also concern about uh, uh, potential growth in the numbers of cases, and we'll talk about that in the presentations to follow. In Asia, though, there's been a plateau in terms of the numbers of cases that are reported from countries like China, uh, with concern about the increasing, rapid increase in numbers of cases in, in Turkey as one example. Next slide. Now we all know that epidemics go through uh, phases and uh, we will hear from the speakers essentially where their countries are in terms and their regions are in terms of these phases. So if you look at the top here, here are the epidemic phases from introduction or emergence uh, to localized transmission followed by amplification and then uh, reduce transmission. And at the bottom, you'll see what should be done. What are the response interventions that need to be done? And these interventions need to be tailored to the epidemic phases. So obviously it's very important to anticipate uh, and be prepared for the uh, potential uh, outbreaks of novel infectious diseases, uh, but also it's critically important to have early detection uh, so that as soon as uh, as a, as, an, as a virus or a pathogen is identified, it can be early uh, detected uh, as soon as possible 
uh, through usually training of uh, clinicians and having astute clinicians in the field who can be uh, alert to identifying unusual cases and also clusters of cases, as well as having laboratories also prepared and surveillance systems in place to be able to detect uh, new pathogens. Then when there's localized transmission, uh, as you can see in this figure here, then containment is the intervention of choice. And by that, we mean identifying the cases rapidly and isolating the cases, as well as identifying their contacts and making sure that all the contacts are quarantined and followed uh, to determine if any of them develop the disease and then to isolate them and then identify their contacts and so on and so forth. And this is a very important phase that must be intervention that needs to be put in place early on in order to uh, make sure that the transmission remains localized. However, with amplification, for example, of transmission, can you go back one slide, please? Go back. How about, however, with amplification of, no, now forward. Yes, with amplification of transmission, uh, at this point, it's very hard to continue the containment efforts, and that's where control and mitigation efforts need to go into action, uh, largely through uh, what you have all uh, are aware of, uh, limitation of travel, uh, closure of schools and universities, uh, lockdown, stay-at-home measures, and social distancing. And then hopefully, if these are effective, then you can go into a mode of suppression uh, with the uh, reduction in transmission and hopefully aim for elimination or eradication. Next slide. Very briefly, I want to tell you what ICAP is doing uh, in the African context, to, particularly to support the COVID-19 response. And as you can see here on your left, uh, there are a variety of activities, including the purchasing and support of uh, personal protective equipment, medical equipment, logistics support in several countries, uh, supporting the establishment of COVID-19 treatment centers, uh, supporting uh, technical assistance um, uh, to, to several countries in their response, supporting the national COVID-19 surveillance system, and then uh, supporting the establishment of fever clinics, triage centers, and health brigades. Next slide, please. In addition, also, we're embarking on a project that is aiming an ambitious project to provide training to 13 countries in, in the, sub, the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, listed here on the right, uh, to train uh, district uh, teams as well as frontline workers in terms of the control, prevention, and management of COVID-19. Next slide. So in summary, COVID-19 pandemic continues to grow and evolve. The U.S. is most severely affected country currently. New York City remains in the eye of the storm. Most countries, uh, African countries, have reported cases of COVID-19 and it's critically important to carefully monitor the epidemic in African countries. Um, as well as to put in place the vigorous, the needed vigorous uh, containment and mitigation measures. And we all know and should always keep in mind that epidemics know no borders. And thus what happens in one country is very uh, critical to all, to all other countries because we are one world and controlling the epidemic in one country is uh, impossible without controlling it elsewhere around the world. So at this point, next slide. We'll move on to hear from several speakers. And um, our first speaker will be presenting the perspective of North Africa. And uh, I hope that uh, Dr. Habiba Ben Rodani is with us on the webinar. And she's a former Minister of Health from Tunisia. I think if uh, Dr. Habiba is, is not with us at this point, we might want to please move the slide to hear from, uh, we're going to hear then from uh, Mark Hawkin, uh, who's going to presenting the perspective from East Africa, to be followed by Blanche Pitt, who will present perspectives from Southern Africa, and then Stefania Koblavi Deme, who is going to present the perspective from West Africa. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Wafa. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, could I have the first slide, please, Hugh? 
Thank you. In, uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to try and give you a snapshot of uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, in, in East Africa. Next slide, please. Um, East Africa, uh, in fact, uh, is defined by uh, the United Nations as uh, uh, 20 territories along the coast of, uh, of, of the eastern region of Africa. But in fact, I'm going to uh, limit myself uh, to uh, Kenya, where, where I am, and to our neighbors, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and South Sudan. Next slide, please. Yes, as, um, as Wafa has said, um, and as you, as, as you well know, the uh, epicenters uh, at the moment are, uh, are located in uh, Europe and in North America, but we are starting to see uh, a smattering of cases throughout Africa, as you can see uh, on, on this map. Uh, next, next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, these were the, uh, uh, the figures yesterday, um, and uh, 53 of the 55 countries in, in Africa had reported cases with uh, confirmed cases of uh, over 23,000 and over 1,000 deaths uh, to date. Next slide, please. Yeah, this... Uh, this uh, line graph just shows uh, the order of, uh, of the countries in terms of uh, confirmed cases um, of COVID-19. And you'll see at the moment, uh, Egypt is leading as number one. Uh, South Africa uh, last week was number one, but number two this week. And uh, you'll see Kenya there uh, in 17th place, um, followed by Tanzania. Um, and the other uh, East African countries that I mentioned. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So I, I just want to give you a, a snapshot of uh, um, what, what's been happening in Kenya. Um, and uh, it's outlined in this slide. The uh, National Emergency Response Committee um, was activated um, uh, earlier in the year. And isolation centers have uh, been established uh, in Nairobi uh, at Kenyatta National Hospital, at Mbagavi Hospital, and more recently at uh, the Kenyatta University uh, Hospital. And our first case was uh, identified on the 13th of March. Um, this was a 27-year-old um, lady who had traveled from the US via, via London um, she has since recovered, um, but two of the passengers on the same uh, aircraft were also, uh, also tested COVID-19 positive. Um, then uh, this was followed uh, by, uh, by our first death uh, shortly thereafter. Next slide, please. These are the uh, figures as of uh, yesterday for Kenya. Kenya has tested uh, over 13,000 people and confirmed 281 cases uh, with uh, 14 deaths. Next slide, please. Yes, this just shows the uh, progression of uh, the epidemic in Kenya um, over, over the last uh, month or so. Um, next slide, please. The actual... Uh, Increasing nature of uh, the epidemic is perhaps shown better in this slide. Next slide, please. And uh, here you'll see that uh, most of the cases have been centered around uh, urban areas, uh, the metropolitan area of uh, Nairobi, uh, and, and also uh, at the coast, particularly uh, the city of Mombasa. But you'll see that uh, with this, this is relatively early and with time it's been uh, spreading out and cases have now been reported in, in Western Kenya as well. Next slide, please.
Yeah, the uh, government uh, response uh, has been uh, particularly strong, um, both, from, uh, both from the President and from the Ministry of Health. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, here just uh, outlines uh, some of the uh, mitigation measures um, that have happened in, in Kenya. So I'll just take you briefly through those. Um, if we, we started uh, with school closure and a public uh, gathering uh, ban. I'm just taking you through from below the uh, timeline, um, the, the blue dots. Um, that was followed um, by our first case um, in uh, early, early March, uh, the 10th of March or so, um, followed by uh, aggressive contract tracing and quarantine of uh, incoming uh, pass passengers. Air borders were then closed to uh, non-residents, um, uh, to non-citizens, uh, and then uh, following that, um, religious gatherings uh, were, were, were banned. Um, visits to prisons have also uh, been, been banned. Um, and then uh, eventually um, all uh, entry uh, by uh, air, road, um, air and road were, were, were closed. Um, <clears throat> following that, uh, um, we had, uh, with increasing numbers of cases, a night curfew uh, imposed. And then um, more recently, um, it has been a, um, really an order for the wearing of masks um, in, in public. Um, again, uh, in response to uh, increasing numbers of cases, particularly in the Nairobi and in the coastal area, um, we've had a travel uh, restriction to and from the Nairobi County and also to and from three of the counties um, at the coast, Mombasa, Kalifi, and Kwale. Next slide, please. <coughs> So this just uh, outlines um, some of the uh, activities that the ministry has put in place in, um, in response uh, to, to the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned that the uh, uh, emergency response team has been activated. Um, a contact tracing team was established early on and has been very, uh, very active. Um, we have uh, at least six national laboratories now that have uh, uh, testing capacity. The capacity is currently good and uh, kits uh, are available currently. Multiple uh, quarantine centres have been established in, in each county, in schools and uh, tertiary uh, institutions, and uh, multiple isolation centres have been set up in each county through, throughout the country. Um, PPE, personal protective uh, equipment, uh, has, is, has been made available uh, through the government and through donations um, by Jack Ma Foundation and others. And that is being uh, distributed through, throughout the country. But um, generally uh, at the moment within the counties is, is quite uh, in limited supply. Um, sensitization uh, training modules have been developed by the Ministry of Health and these are currently being delivered to uh, healthcare workers by, uh, by video conferencing and uh, SOPs and guidelines have been, have been written and, uh, and distributed. Um, in, in addition, uh, the government has uh, announced some social relief um, in terms of tax relief for, for people who are earning less than 240 uh, US dollars per month. Um, there's been a reduction in pay as you earn from 30% to 25% and value-added value tax has been reduced from 16 to 14%, which has uh, already been put uh, in, in effect. Next slide, please. So having given you some idea of what's happening in Kenya, I just wanted to look at uh, very briefly at uh, our neighbors and um, similar uh, mitigation activities have been put in place um, in each of these countries. Um, this uh, just shows the picture in uh, 
South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan only have four confirmed cases, uh, all introduced from, from outside, uh, and no deaths uh, so far. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the picture in Ethiopia. They have 111 reported uh, cases uh, as of uh, yesterday um, with uh, three deaths. Um, the government there has uh, introduced a five-month national state of emergency um, and interestingly have uh, pardoned hundreds of prisoners um, in an attempt to uh, reduce transmission within, within the prisons. Next slide, please. Um, this is the picture for Uganda with 55 uh, reported cases and no deaths so far. Um, the uh, government response in Uganda has been particularly, um, they've taken it particularly seriously and put in severe measures. Um, most of the ones that I've mentioned uh, for Kenya and the other countries are, are in place. But in addition, they had put in uh, restriction of uh, well, suspension of public uh, transport and, uh, and also private transport, and they've shut down uh, all ma malls uh, and shopping centers. Uh, the only shops that are open are, are food uh, shops. Next slide, please. This shows the, uh, the picture in, in Tanzania. Um, they, yesterday they had reported 255 cases um, and 10 deaths, so sort of a similar picture to Kenya. A week ago, uh, they actually only had about 55 cases, so they've really um, increased their cases over the last week. The first case um, was a 46-year-old uh, um, Tanzanian man um, who had come from, from Belgium uh, in, in March. So as I said, similar um, mitigation measures have been put in place, but uh, Tanzania had not uh, made it uh, compulsory for bars, restaurants, shops, or, or churches to, to close. Next slide, please. Uh, this just uh, compares the um, first 30-day uh, trajectory um, the number of cases reported um, in Kenya, as you'll see there in, in the lead, with the other uh, four countries that I've been talking about. So you see a much steeper increase uh, over the first uh, one month uh, from Kenya. Next slide, please. The next one uh, just shows Kenya compared to South Africa. I thought that was an interesting comparison with, with much steeper increase in numbers reported in, in South Africa compared uh, to Kenya. Next slide, please. I just wanted to uh, turn now at this stage to, um, to, to talk about the support that uh, ICAP has put uh, in place. Um, we, are, we are currently supporting um, a teaching and referral hospital in Kisumu and uh, there we've uh, assisted them with establishing um, outside uh, triage uh, areas. Uh, we've designed and printed um, SOPs um, and algorithms. We've helped them um, design and, and print um, m and tools and registers to keep track of, uh, of the number of cases, number of emissions and discharges. Um, we've provided PPE and sanitizer and um, at, currently we are uh, equipping an isolation unit um, in preparation for, for, for a presumed surge uh, with uh, a kind donation from a Dr. Zhao, um, who is a member of the uh, Columbia Board of Visitors, who has kindly uh, donated money towards uh, this cause. Next slide, please. I just wanted to uh, uh, pause for, to think just about vulnerable populations, particularly in Africa, uh, street children um, that uh, don't uh, have a home to, to stay in, um, 
persons with psychiatric illness, um, and here I'm talking about those with severe psychiatric illness in, in, in hospital where it may be difficult to um, I, uh, practice uh, social distancing um, and the other measures, persons who inject drugs, um, and those on methadone programs, um, those in uh, elderly care homes um, who have uh, much increased uh, um, risk and uh, risk of uh, severe disease, and uh, those living below the, the poverty line. Next slide, please. So uh, in summary, um, Kenya and neighboring countries are at a relatively early stage of the pandemic. Uh, however, uh, community transmission is occurring. Um, mitigation measures have been put in place within the context of political and socioeconomic uh, environment. Um, but uh, mitigation measures are severely impacted by poverty and by high density informal housing. Uh, test kits, PPE, and specialized care are likely to be in short supply as the pandemic uh, progresses. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Okay, welcome Blanche. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, the next slide, please. Thank you. So my presentation will briefly cover the status of the COVID pandemic in Southern Africa. I will then proceed with a deeper dive into South Africa and the country's response to the pandemic. Next slide, please. This slide gives a snapshot of the exponential increase of COVID-19 across Southern African countries. And um, I'll be referring to the nine Southern African countries highlighted on the map um, on the left of my screen for the period of 5th of March to the 19th of April. So from the time of the first reported case, we see a continuous upward trajectory for Southern Africa. And you can see the line graph um, on, on the right. Over just a period of four weeks, the virus has infected almost 4,000 people across Southern Africa. And as Wafa said earlier, these numbers account only for the recorded and confirmed cases of COVID-19. The actual number could be much higher. So without significantly increasing testing coverage, the data will continue to reflect only the people who themselves report for testing and their contacts. And this really highlights the need for expanding our testing coverage. Next slide, please. Here you can see the increase in the first wave of the COVID-19 in South Africa compared with the total number of combined COVID cases in Southern Africa. Of concern is, of course, the high prevalence of immunosuppressive conditions, including HIV and other comorbidities, which increases susceptibility to COVID infections. South Africa remains the epicenter of the COVID pandemic in Southern Africa, as well as the country with the largest AIDS epidemic globally. And this really highlights that while we are intensifying our mitigation measures for COVID-19, that we need to ensure that HIV, TB clients and other clients with comorbidities have access to and remain on treatment. Otherwise, we would again see quite a rapid increase of those more susceptible. Next slide, please. While during the first wave of the pandemic, the number of COVID confirmed cases in Southern Africa has been relatively low so far compared to other countries um, in the West. We are starting to see a steady increase, as you can see on the slide, 
across all countries, um, except Lesotho, who is to date not confirmed cases. If you look at Zambia, that's um, the second highest number, with 61 confirmed cases within one month of its first case, followed by Mozambique, with 39 confirmed cases within four weeks, and Zimbabwe with 25 as of the 19th of April. This shows us the rate to which the pandemic is rapidly spreading across Southern Africa. And we really have very limited time to change the course of this epidemic. From the lessons learned, we recognize that it is critical that countries prioritize testing to, indeed, to identify those infected early and put in place good systems for contact tracing and isolation as well as other mitigation measures we've seen have made an impact, like lockdown, social distancing. From the South African experience, we have seen that internal transmission has a tendency to spread rapidly and silently. So we, we can't afford to, to be complacent. There has been much concern about the existing capacity, of course, um, with regard to the hospitals across Africa. Um, capacity of ICUs, of health workers, supply chain capability, as well as good surveillance systems. A positive step, though, in, is, is the remarkable collaboration that we have seen um, with joint planning and sharing of lessons and resources among African countries, which has been facilitated by, by various bodies, including AU, WHO, and CDC. And so we are um, really very serious about learning from, you know, what has worked um, both in Europe um, and in America, but also, of course, across Africa. Next slide, please. In terms of date of reporting the COVID cases, South Africa was the first country to report the COVID case followed by Iswatini and Namibia nine days later. All Southern African countries went into lockdown soon after the very first confirmed case of COVID-19, with a mean of about 8.7 days from the time of the first reported case to lockdown. And as we have learned from uh, the lessons from the other countries, of course, early lockdown and social distancing has been shown to be two of the most effective mitigating measures for COVID-19. And so it's really encouraging to see that countries in Southern Africa have since implemented a range of additional measures to slow down the spread of COVID-19. What we have learned is that the importance of each country developing strategic plans to deal with the epidemic. You will notice I have a question mark um, next to Malawi. And uh, you may all be aware that um, the president was uh, 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 challenged by the court um, on introducing lockdown. And um, so we're really hoping that that matter will soon be resolved. Next slide. In South Africa, so this slide shows the um, upward trend that we have seen in South Africa. So I'll start just focusing on South Africa for now. And here we can see there's been an exponential increase of COVID-19 over the period uh, starting the 5th of March, April 19th. And the significance of the impact of the lockdown is evident. Um, if you can look at the screen and perhaps look at the 27th of March, that's when we had our lockdown. And what we saw from uh, the 27th is we did not see that spiraling increase that we observed during the prior period, um, starting in from the 5th of March. And so lockdown has really made a significant impact. We have after that seen a continued increase um, as the country rolled out its nationwide um, screening and testing. Um, and as of 
the 19th of April, we had 3,158 cases confirmed. Next slide, please. I'd like to pause a bit on this slide because um, it really also shows not only the trajectory of the epidemic in South Africa, but um, what's significant about the slide is, you know, if one looks um, at the, where we start on the 5th of March um, until the 13th of March, that was the period where um, the transmission was external. So um, the infected cases were coming from countries, uh, high burden COVID countries. Our first internal transmission cases, uh, confirmed uh, internal transmission cases, happened on the 13th of March. And so from the 13th of March, of course, you know, going forward, we can see that um, there's a gradual increase and then quite a significant increase on the 27th of March, um, where the country reported 243 cases for that specific day. And that's been one of the highest, um, the highest number of cases per day that we have seen. So if you can look at the bottom of the screen again on the dates, where you can see the 27th of March and 28th of March. So South Africa went into lockdown on the 27th of March. And we notice a remarkable downward trend thereafter. It's very significant. Um, so while many factors influence the trajectory, the positive impact of lockdown, as we've seen in other countries, also had a significant impact on the downward trend um, uh, uh, that we see on this, on this slide. So the days that followed, again, showed an upward trend. And then on the 11th, we see a dip. Um, the 11th just also happens to be um, a day on which the majority of South Africans celebrate Easter Sunday. So following lockdown, the country swiftly moved into emergency preparedness and from the 28th of March started with symptom wide, sorry, nationwide symptom screening using mobile technology to intensify contact tracing and introduced more accessible testing through mobile labs. The more we expanded our testing and improvements in contact tracing, the more COVID cases we were finding. And you can see, if you again look at the graph, how 18, towards the 18th of April, we, we saw um, a significant upward um, trend again. Next slide, please. So the total number of confirmed cases as of April 18 was 3,158, as I've said, with Gauteng, the economic hub of, of South Africa, the worst affected. And at the time, they had 1,148 cases, followed by the Western Cape with 868 cases, and KZN with 617 confirmed cases. So the total number of COVID deaths for the country at the time stood at 54, with KZN, KwaZulu Natal, reporting the highest number of deaths. What we have observed with the deaths in South Africa is that um, these deaths have not only occurred among older people and those with comorbidities, but also amongst the young. And it's of course very, very worrying. Um, Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so so this, is, this is an interesting way of illustrating South Africa's response. Um, it was actually Abdul Karim, who many of you may be familiar with, and is also an advisor to the um, South African president on, on COVID-19. Um, so Abdul came up with a, a very systematic way of staging the South African response. 
Um, and as you look across this diagram, uh, you know, these stages reinforce each other. So it does not mean that when one stage stops, the other starts. Rather, it's a continuation and an expansion of mitigation measures over time. Again, you know, this was presented on the 10th of April, therefore it only shows data up to the end of April. Um, but I'll just quickly go through the stages and what they represent. So the first stage, and that was almost immediately after, uh, um, in late February, before we had our first case, it was extensive community education, um, the country assessed and prepared lab and hospital capacity and strengthened our surveillance system. During the second stage, and this happened after the 5th of March, that's after our first confirmed cases, um, there was increased emphasis on social distancing, on hand washing, closure of schools and borders, um, small gatherings uh, or prohibiting large gatherings rather. And as I've mentioned earlier, on the 27th, we went into lockdown. Um, the stage four, which is, um, we are still, you know, intensifying this community health door-to-door -door screening. So active case finding, rather than waiting on clients to come to the health facility. And referral of those with symptoms for testing. Stage four also um, started with triaging. So putting up tents outside the hospitals to, to, to triage clients. Um, one of the areas that is really uh, uh, um, guiding us so that we use whatever tests we have uh, uh, um, very carefully is that South Africa has really focused on hot, what we call hot spots. Um, and these are areas where we have concentrated numbers of confirmed cases, of contacts. Um, and so we've clustered those areas, and, uh, which, which we call hotspots. And so the tests that are being done are in and around those hotspots. And then stage five, sorry, pardon, stage six, um, which is at the top there, is medical care. Um, we continue to expand the capacity of the health system to cope with the increased numbers that we are seeing now. So we are looking at converting, well, not looking at, already doing it, um, converting sports fields and other huge venues into hospitals, expanding ICU beds, um, ventilators and all required equipment. And, uh, and then we get to stage seven, um, is really a very, very sad stage. And that's uh, what we have seen in the US, in Italy, um, in Spain, in China, is um, the aftermath of this um, pandemic. And, and so, but as a country, also to prepare to expand burial capacity and regulations on funerals and of course, also manage psychological and social impact um, that this pandemic will have. Um, so those are the stages. And um, as I've said, you know, it's, it's kind of a continuum. The one stage continues into the next, but these certain components that, um, of course, uh, uh, highlighted and focused on more. Um, throughout all of these stages, um, we, the, the, the importance of um, surveillance and real-time data um, is, has received increasing attention um, to guide us again, you know, to where we should focus our energy and our resources. Next slide, please. So Mark made reference to this in his presentation as well. Um, during the initial period of the pandemic, much attention was directed at measures to contain the epidemic. What followed was the acknowledgement of the impact of these measures on poor communities. And this picture shows, um, you know, the conditions under which some of these communities are living. 
And here we, of course, have a large percentage of the communities who have uh, small businesses, informal markets, spaza shops, and also a high number of homeless people uh, living on the streets. Another reality, of course, and especially in the context of isolation, is the high density of the houses in informal settlements and townships where people don't only live on top of each other, but where households often consist of large numbers of extended families living under one roof, often sharing the toilets and the taps. And so in South Africa, we have seen pushback of the vulnerable communities to lockdown measures, uh, which, which doesn't come as a surprise given this context. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me was never before have inequalities been highlighted to this extent as it has with this pandemic? Next slide, please. So this shows the, the kind of livelihoods that I referred to earlier. Um, and, and many of these communities, of course, survive on little money. They make money on a daily basis. Um, so instead of protecting themselves from a threat, which in, in their world may only be seen in abstract terms um, to these communities having to stay indoors and depriving them of what they regard as essential in order to put food on the table. Next slide, please. And so again, I think across Africa and countries with similar conditions, there are many lessons that we can learn of what has worked in these environments. And um, as Africa, we of course need to take into account the context of our countries and how we can best contain the spread and reduce the devastating impact of the high burden of COVID in communities already challenged by the socioeconomic circumstances. Next slide, please. And so in closing, um, just uh, to summarize, what we have seen is that every country in Southern Africa with reported COVID cases has taken certain restrictive measures to curb the spread of the pandemic. South Africa also has a unique epidemic trajectory attributable to early action, including lockdown, hotspot identification, extensive screening, testing, and targeted community level intervention. And going forward from all the lessons that we have learned, what's become apparent is we need to stay ahead of the spread of the COVID-19 at all costs and not wait for patients to come to the hospital. Ongoing house to house screening and testing in vulnerable communities is really important and again, as Wafa mentioned, we have confirmed cases of conf numbers of confirmed cases, uh, but there may be many more. And the need to continue and intensify surveillance, um, more so weekly real time data and contact tracing. And what we need to prepare for in anticipation of an acceleration of transmission. Um, we have seen in the U.S. how field hospitals have been set up for triage, um, alternate arrangements for um, uh, uh, decanting hospitals to prepare the staff, especially intensive care and hospital staff that need to be very well prepared. Um, and of course, to be able to secure all the procurement requirements um, to, to really implement our mitigation matters. Um, measures. And in closing, test, 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 and test. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blanche. And um, I know we're running uh, late, so we're going to extend the time of the Zoom, but I urge uh, both Stefania and Habiba to be as brief as possible in their presentation so we have some time for questions. Uh, please go ahead, Stefania. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, okay, can I have my first slide? The second one. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about Cote d'Ivoire. 
Cote d'Ivoire is part of the of West Africa. So Cote d'Ivoire is ranked in the top 10 of African countries impacted uh, by the COVID-19. So we are the seven country all over Africa. But if you look at West Africa, after Ghana, you have Cote d'Ivoire. Next slide, please. Next. So to have, to, I'm showing you here a snapshot of the situation in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire as of uh, yesterday. So first case was uh, registered March 11. And you see that the progression is constant day by day. Up to now, we have been able to realize uh, 5,000 uh, PCR tests RT-PCR test for the diagnosis. Uh, 916 cases have been confirmed. 600 are on treatment. 300 have already recovered. And unfortunately, 13 people passed away. Next slide, please. If you look at this map, you see that the high burden in the country is Abidjan with uh, 49, with 94% of the cases reported in Abidjan. The first cases was coming from abroad, Europe and Middle East. Next slide, please. If we look at the sex and age group distribution of cases, you can see that we have also children and adolescents who are impacted. But also, if you look at the distribution between men and women, you see that uh, most men are infected than women, maybe because they have more social contacts. Next slide, please. The Côte d'Ivoire government uh, takes strong action. Uh, our president, our prime minister were strongly involved to take the, the decision to be able to install measure to try to control the disease. So related to public health, measure has been taken to contain the infection spreading, to prevent the, this infection spreading with protective personal equipment for healthcare workers, but also treatment algorithms have been, have been designed in, and to motivate the healthcare workers, the Ministry of Health uh, give them incentives. Uh, social distancing uh, is very important to fight against this uh, pandemic. So hand washing, uh, mask wearing, up to now, everybody who is uh, outside in Abidjan should wear a, a mask. Uh, Besides this, security measures are also very important with the curfew and the lockdown of Abidjan. Economical measures are also very important. If you think at what Blanche and Marc just show, show us, you see that uh, vulnerable population are, are also in, in Cote d'Ivoire very, uh, can be very um, impacted by, by the disease. So there is food distribution, and there is free bills for electricity and water for them for a three month period. Next slide, please. So how our Ministry of Health is also in, in front of the, of, of, the, of the action. So they have um, a website where you can go on a daily basis and have the, the correct information. Uh, what they have already done is to set up referral center to identify the priority facilities who are able to receive the, the patient. They have also installed quarantine sites and something very important, increased laboratory capacities using Pasteur Institute, RetroC and CEDRES uh, um, infrastructure. Also to train people in, the, in this context where people cannot be uh, in meetings, they use um, Zoom or Echo platform to train healthcare workers. 
what is go ongoing right now is to set up voluntary screening sites in Abidjan and in country. And also they are building prefabricated uh, system to receive patients for care and treatment. Next slide, please. Partner involvement are very important in our context. So WHO is, co is the coordinating body and uh, for all the partners. And they also deal with the surveillance and the, with the Ministry of Health, they issue the situation report now on a daily basis. The US government also, for example, uh, through CDC and USAID propose assistance. And we have also the, the support of the Africa CDC. Next slide, please. Next, please. So to conclude, uh, in March, upon mathematical model, an estimation was done and Cote d'Ivoire should reach for, based on this model coming from the London School of Health uh, of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine. The estimation was that Cote d'Ivoire should reach the first 1,000 cases by April 15, but we have not yet reached that. And what they, they were planned, they were expecting also or estimated also that at the first week of May, we should have reached 10,000 cases. We really hope that with all the measures which have been taken by the government of Cote d'Ivoire with local and international partners, we will be aimed to flatten the peak of this epidemic and allow the health system to absorb the increased number of patients. What we think also is that this situation could be looked at, uh, this situation could, could be looked at uh, a durable experience for the next sanitary crisis because for sure our continent will face other crises, but we hope that what we are going through now will help us to be prepared for next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania. And we move next to Dr. Habiba. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will present first the, 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 the first slides, please. Do you have, OK. Just I, I would like to, to uh, say some words about the forces and opportunity of the health system uh, to uh, control COVID-19. We have uh, three uh, departments that are involved in this uh, uh, strategy. The first one is the Strategic Center for Health Operation Shock Room. Uh, it was implemented in 2009 uh, during the Ashana epidemic. No, before, please. Please come back to the first one. No. Yes. Yeah. We have also the Department of Primary Health Care uh, with uh, each, uh, with uh, uh, many, um, uh, a rich uh, uh, network. Uh, also, we have the National Observatory of New and Emerging Disease. Uh, all uh, these institutions are co uh, coordinate their intervention to prepare the plan to uh, control a large scale crisis, natural or provoked crisis. Second one, please. Uh, the response to the set and the large scale crisis are the objective is, are to ensure the real-time collection of health alerts, to ensure the exchange of information and coordination with other departments with managing crisis, provide communication tools, provide tools from monitoring, and uh, to uh, the surveillance, the even uh, event-based surveillance, they have also a tool for 
exchange uh, information by weekly con uh, uh, weekly uh, bulletin, and also, please what? The next, please. Uh, the Tunisian response to COVID, the first uh, news uh, letter uh, edit was edited uh, on uh, January 22 to start the, uh, the strategy of, uh, uh, to control uh, the epidemic. Next slide, please. Uh, the objective of uh, this uh, response uh, is to curb the spread of uh, the epidemic within the population in order to minimize the potential health impact and reduce infection, illness, and death. Second slide, please. What were and what are the uh, planning principles of this uh, Tunisian response? Uh, we uh, built, or Tunisia built, a strong leadership and coordination of the response, activation of the response and resilience plan for disease with epidemic potential, potential. A dynamic risk assessment of potential health and other impacts using the best available scientific advice and evidence to inform decision, decision making. Uh, Tunisia uh, worked also at, is working with the WHO, the African CDC Center and the Chinese CDC Center. Uh, the most important uh, uh, strategy was the early warning and response system, the five uh, early. Second slide, please. Second, next. The early warning and response system that was implement, uh, implemented early uh, during the uh, uh, month of March is early case detection, uh, early, dete uh, early uh, declaration, early detection and especially contact tracing, isolation of patient and early uh, treatment. Next, next please. The measure were isolation of all positive cases, quarantine of subject at risk, and containment measures. Second, please. There is the uh, uh, tra transmission uh, type during the uh, time. Uh, the first stage was the imp uh, imported case. It started from February 28 to March 9. All cases being reported uh, have been uh, occurred or uh, they, they came from, from outside, especially the, the first one came from Italy. The intervention declaration, case isolation, contact tracing, uh, uh, voluntary quarantine at home and borders control. The second stage was the local transmission. Uh, it starts on March 10 and to April uh, 14. Uh, the source of infection is with the country and uh, the intervention. Uh, uh, Tunisia, I think that Tunisia started the uh, intervention for the third stage during the second stage. So we have voluntary home quarantine, social distancing, closure at, of school and universities, curfew from March 17, and general containment from March 22. Now we are at the uh, community uh, transmission. I think it's, uh, since April 14, it's, uh, we have a large outbreaks at local uh, uh, of local uh, transmission, large number of kids from Sentinel lab, and uh, some hotspots. Uh, Tunisia adopted the uh, the same intervention that uh, 
were adopted during the second stage and uh, they added the um, mandatory isolation. Next, please. So, uh, the, what is the situation now? Uh, we almost, uh, well, uh, uh, the screening, um, many people uh, think, uh, think that, think that uh, we did not test enough in Tunisia. Uh, so, we uh, PCR were, were, was tested among us almost 18,000 uh, persons. The total case until now we have uh, uh, eight, eight, uh, eight, <laughs> I say, please come back to the next, please. Uh, so, uh, we have 80, 179 uh, uh, cases. Uh, it's about uh, seven uh, per uh, uh, 100,000 people. Six, ra uh, six ratio is one. So we have uh, the same number among women and men. We have also uh, some many cases among health workers. Uh, and uh, uh, we, ha we have not a lot of uh, deaths. We have just uh, 37 uh, deaths. Uh, the uh, case fatality is, is uh, it's very low and the mortality ratio also. Uh, next, please. This is the uh, trend of the epidemic. So we have the uh, histogram is the number of cases per day, and the line is uh, the uh, number. So we, the the uh, big variation. So we have sometimes we have a lot of uh, people uh, screened and uh, that are uh, positive, and after we have less people. We think that it was the problem with the uh, screening. So uh, the, uh, we are sure that uh, the number, the, the real number, is more than uh, we detected. Next, please. So when we started, we uh, the first case was detected in March two. It was in the southwest uh, uh, city, Gafsa, near uh, Algeria. And now we have all the uh, gover governorate uh, uh, have uh, detected uh, some uh, ca cases. Uh, we have some hotspots. The, the red one are the uh, hotspots. So Tunis, the capital, Sousse, the uh, southeast, and also the southwest. We have the number incidence rate per uh, 100,000 people. So we, and the, we, the, the, this, the problem is the spread is very, very, uh, uh, some, some, uh, some uh, cities, uh, spread was very, very uh, uh, in uh, some uh, cities. Next, please. What are the challenges? The first challenge is uh, how the screening strategy. How to enhance and uh, scale of screening. Uh, is it, uh, uh, should we progress the uh, contact or uh, to uh, have uh, more or mass screening? This is a debate the debate in Tunisia. Also, how to uh, integrate and involve uh, primary health care in this, uh, this screening and the uh, uh, contact tracing. This is also, th there is a discussion about this. How to uh, prepare the medical care, especially for the uh, intensive uh, care unit. We have almost 500 uh, between public and private sector. 
is it enough or not? Also, this is a discussion. We have a discussion about this. The, the crucial issue shown now is how to to uh, to to, uh, to improve the healthcare for general population, especially NCDs, maternal and ch child health, mother health emergency. Because since the uh, the, the, the epidemic. People uh, do not seek care, especially for NCDs, and uh, we uh, we think that we will have a, a negative impact for uh, this population. So we are uh, preparing and we are thinking how to start restart the uh, the uh, the care for this uh, group of population. It's not easy because we have to organize all the uh, uh, hospitals primary health care to have two pathways, one for uh, provides positive and one, one for provides negative. And we have also to protect the uh, population, uh, the health worker, the, the, this, uh, and also to, uh, uh, to inform them. I think that we have to inform and to uh, protect Health, uh, health worker and uh, to uh, respond to their psychological needs. We have also another challenge is how to prepare the country for uh, the after containment, the management of the uh, work spaces. Uh, how to, uh, uh, are we prepared for this? We are uh, uh, thinking about uh, this, uh, the, and uh, we have its multi-sectorial approach and uh, all the sectors need to be involved in this, uh, in this project. Next, please. The, there is also a, a, a huge issue with the economic and social challenges. Uh, I think that Tunisia is uh, like many of uh, uh, countries uh, in Africa, but also elsewhere, uh, Tunisia is facing the deepest recession since its independence in 1956. Uh, we have uh, macroeconomic imbalances and a very high external uh, as, uh, as well public debt we uh, how to contain the spread of the virus mitigate the human social and economic needs made an uh, unprecedented vulnerability and to ensure the sustainability of the external debate uh, the, this measure involve raising health spending strengthening social social safety and supporting the small and medium uh, um, hit by the crisis and the in, uh, employment. So, so beside the uh, health issues, uh, there is economical and social uh, challenge, and it will be uh, very difficult for the for Tunisia to resolve uh, all these problems. Next, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Habiba, and thanks to all the speakers. I know we've gone way over time, uh, and uh, we will be posting uh, this um, webinar on the ICAP website, as well as the Global Center website, uh, for, for you to share with others as well. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have um, any time for uh, questions today, but we have received several questions um, and uh, those questions uh, will be answered also. We'll post the answers to uh, these questions uh, uh, shortly. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for your participation today and particularly for your interest in this uh, very important topic in terms of what is going on now in the African continent. 
as well as also thinking about the measures that have been put in place, as well as the, the concerns about uh, what's going to happen next in terms of the trajectory of this uh, pandemic um, and the importance of the global community uh, at this point in time in making a commitment, uh, a deep commitment to try to support the work that's going on in Africa as demonstrated by all the speakers today uh, and to stand by uh, these countries uh, during this very uh, difficult time. Uh, so thank you very much everyone, particularly I want to thank uh, the global centers in Tunis and in Kenya for co-sponsoring this webinar and uh, thank all of our speakers today and thank all of our audience for joining us uh, today on this webinar. Have a good day and uh, take care.